Thank you so much for tuning in to Ivy Film Festival's virtual panel discussion, Costume Design for Film and TV. My name is Lulu Kavicki, and I am a sophomore here at Brown, one of the festival speakers and screeners coordinators and the student moderator for today's event. Um, I'm so excited to introduce you to our two panelists for today, Denise Wingate and Ellen Mirajnik. Um, Denise Wingate is a costume designer for film and television whose credits include fan favorite titles like Cruel Intentions, She's All That, Wedding Crashers, and A Cinderella Story. Her latest project was Amazon Studios and, Hel and Hello Sunshine's Daisy Jones and the Six, a 1960s and 1970s set miniseries based on the book by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Ellen Mirajnik is a costume designer for film and television whose lauded career spans more than three decades. Uh, Ellen began designing for Hollywood productions with notable credits such as Fatal Attraction and Wall Street, both with her frequent collaborator, actor Michael Douglas. Mirajnik is a two-time BAFTA award-winning nominee, and she received an Emmy and a Costume Designers Guild Award for her work on Steven Soderbergh's Liberace biopic, Behind the Candelabra. Mirajnik's most recent credits include The Greatest Showman, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, Bridgerton, and Christopher Nolan's upcoming movie, Oppenheimer. Both so impressive. Um, so now we're going to head into our questions for today, and we also invite anyone in the audience to send in um, Q&As via the function at the bottom of the Zoom. So to start, uh, since I know we have a lot of students watching today, I'd love to hear about how you both started in costume design. Um, how did you come into the profession, and maybe what were some of your first projects? Um, and maybe we'll start with Denise, and then we can go to Ellen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I had a little unconventional start. I moved to New York when I was really young, 18, and uh, started assisting. I had a neighbor that you know, Ellen, owed Bronson Howard. Of course. And yeah, so I started assisting her and just started working and PAing and worked my way up. And I just never stopped working. I didn't go to fashion school. I was a, took some psychology courses, which are helpful now <laughs> in what I do, but literally just worked my way up and did any job I could get. Uh, I assisted for years. So that's, I learned on the job. What about you, Ellen? Well, I, I, I started um, at, in the fashion industry first mm -hmm. and then moved over to um, film after I got bored. I, I was in fashion for about, um, uh, I, I would say about seven years and then I got bored. And then by accident, I fell into the to the film business, but my husband at that time was doing a very low budget, very R rated. I think it was maybe almost X rated um, mm -hmm. film. That was a period piece of all things. And they didn't have a costume designer. I said, you want to do it? And I said, yeah, sure. And that's how it began. I guess it just always begins by accident. Mm -hmm. More often than not, I have found with costume designers, I think so many of us have started kind of by happenstance and it's just like one foot in front of the other and learn on the job I think mostly instead of really studying this in school I agree I mean I was in retail and worked for a Turkish designer but when I met you know when I started when I met a stylist and then met Ode and um I just it I had no plans of being a costume designer. it wasn't something that was on my radar at all I, and it just I fell into it by accident and that's here we are. <laughs> huh. I was going to say, that's so interesting to hear that like both sort of on accident or something that you weren't totally expecting, something that you didn't necessarily go to school for, but you're both doing such an amazing job. And you're that being said, I wish I would have gone to school because I would have liked to have had a little, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, in, in retrospect, it all worked out fine, but I wish yeah. I would have had the time to be able to, to study more and mm -hmm or drafting or, you know, I mean, I, I can do everything, but not very well. <laughs> but I think that we learn very, very, I, I think that I never learned anything in school. I really, really never did learn anything about this in this profession in school. I just liked movies. I loved entertainment and I loved movies. And that's where my passion was. And I happened to have come from a clothing, if you will, background because of the fashion. That's, would I have picked another category to maybe try? Maybe I might've, but it was just, a, it was an easier kind of slide sideways mm -hmm. at that time. But I think that every time we go to work on a new project, it doesn't matter where it's exhibited, whether it is 
on television, whether it's streamed, whether it's a movie, whether it's a show, whether it's live, whether it's whatever, it's like we open up a new company every single time we go to work. And, and when we open up this company, we become like the CEOs mm -hmm. and you have to hire people to work with you and for you. And whatever you don't know, you have to learn really quickly. And you have to have the support teams to help you learn everything that you have to know about that particular project, the subject, the time, the place, all, everything, just name it and you have to know it. So you, you have to have very good managerial skills. You have mm -hmm. to be a leader. You know how to have to know how to run. It's like a business. You have it to be, you're, you're the president of the company and you need to, to, to all aspects of what you do. You're running an entire corporation for whatever amount of time that is. And you have exactly. to have good, you have to be organized. You have to know how to be diplomatic. You have to know how to be a leader and, and you have to be an accountant, everything else, everything. Every, you have to know all of that, which has nothing to do with design. Exactly. <laughs> only what to do with leadership. Mm -hmm. And you have to be that leader who is willing to take that responsibility, willing to stand up for all of the people that you have with you. And you also have to know how to hire the right people for the right job. It all comes with experience. But if you have just gut feelings about, about people, about how to do things, about how to put things together. I think that you can actually embark on this, this profession with um, some confidence, but you really do have to have that confidence. And I, I always say, and I think that they don't teach this in school, which is, I think the most important um, category that you really have to learn is communication. And because our business is only about communication, only about that. Agreed. So it's not so much about, well, it is, of course, about design and, and visualization and understanding how to tell a story through design. But most importantly, it is so much about communication, communicating your ideas to not only your team, but to the director to the producer, to the cinematographer, to everyone involved. To the actors, you know, and that's the actors, really important. And the actors, now mind you, everybody could have a totally different opinion, but you have to be that one to manage those opinions and decisions so that everyone gets to be on the same page. And I always say you never marry to get married to one idea because it's always, it's, it's a changeable business. It's very fluid and, and very things fluid. change. And the, and the more time you have and the more time you have to spend with the actors and have fittings, things change. They morph into something else. I mean, and sometimes you get an actor the night before they work and it is what it is. Well, it sounds like being a costume designer involves like a hundred jobs and one, not just design. Um, I love to hear about, especially for people in our audience who might not know about how um, like costume design works on a television set or a film set. How do you um, put together a team um, for the costumes? How do you put together like a crew or bring people on to a project? Well, I think it starts, it always starts with finding a good costume supervisor, which is, um, you know, the, 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 your sort of right hand person that's going to help break down the script, do the budget, hopefully hire people, especially if you're on location and you have to hire local people. You want somebody that knows who those people are, who gets along well with others. And and I think it starts with that. And it just depends on how big the project is, how many people you have. I, I at this point in my um, in my career, I have no problem firing people immediately if they don't work out. I've gotten I used to be really nice and tried to make it work out. I cut bait early on. I can tell I have a really good instinct. If somebody's not working out, I, I, I cut bait. Um, I don't like to, but I just don't have the time or energy at this point to teach people on the job. I'm but, but I think that that's how it always goes. I mean, you have to be able to be efficient in every single aspect of putting together the correct team for the correct for the project that you're involved in each project is different each project is based on um the the one common denominator will be the budget 
what is the budget? Is it small, medium, or large, or extra large? That will determine how many people are really necessary. Is it a period film? Is it a specialty film? Is it a contemporary film? Is it a combination of any of those aspects? Are you going to have to have a workroom that you make things in? Are you going to have to have specialty craftspeople who are going to make things? Or are you going to take all of it outside of your um, outside of your team and outside of the house to be able to get done? All of those things are totally dependent on what kind of projects you're on. Was Bridgerton the biggest crew you've ever had on, on any project? Um, you know, it might have been, it might have been a little extra large because Maleficent. Oh, Maleficent, that's pretty big too. What? Yes, Mr. Z, that was a, a, an exceptionally large crew as well. Um, and so I think that the, the reason why Bridgerton was extra large was simply because nothing existed when we went to, when, when, I was given the pilot to read of, of Bridgerton and the synopsis. I had originally worked um, a few times or had gone and done some fixes for Shonda Rhimes and that company and, and knew somewhat about their aesthetic, which is different than real life, like real, real life. And so after I read it, I said, okay, so this is a bonnetless universe, right? And you want an aesthetic that is a combination of aspiration and inspirational and something fresh and something period, and you want it all meshed together. Oh yes, that's exactly what- And none want. of that exists. <laughs> of course not. So basically I created a book that a visual reference and said, is this what you want? And so, and they said, right, that's what we want. <laughs> and so that was like a little handbook, more or less. But mm -hmm. none of it really existed because we changed things. And it was so, we changed lines, we changed fabrications, we changed colors, we changed- The colors were everything. amazing. I mean, it was so fresh and so different and- Very, very, very different. And um, and what we were able to do with having a whole team of cutters and fitters and fabricators and jewelry makers and embellishers and, 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 was- having like a little factory and a little company that we're making everything from the beginning um, from, from scratch basically, and knew that we couldn't rent anything. Yeah. That was the problem. We had to make it all to <laughs> fill somewhat of a small costume house and be able to use it and be able to use it not only for um, our principals, but day players and extras and anybody who walked through the door. So mm -hmm. it, we needed to do that really quickly so that we could actually begin on time. And um, it was a bit of a challenge, I what guess. What was your prep time from, from when you first started to shooting? Um, I believe it was, Jennifer, it was only about five and a half months. Okay. Months, okay. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it, that's a lot. It was, to... It's a, it was a two from nothing. It was yeah. literally from nothing to all. Well, not, I shouldn't say to a lot. The, a lot started to come in, come in, come in, come in. We could start. And I think that we started really in our shop. I, I think it was, if my memory serves me, the beginning of February. And we went to shoot the end of July. And how many episodes? Sorry, I'm I'm asking questions, Lulu, because I'm no, so we curious. Love it. It's a conversation. Well, I'm going to get to your questions. So yes, go ahead. How, how many, many episodes, episodes were were the first season? Ten. Ten. Okay, so that's yeah. yeah. They, well, they were they were always. I think it's ten. No, it yeah. was eight. Was okay. it eight? I think it was eight. 
whatever it was is not what what it's always been. I believe it was eight, eight, not ten. I think it might have been eight too. It was right because I remember yeah. eight balls. So that's that's <laughs> how, that's the only way I can. I don't remember the storyline. I just remember eight balls. All the balls. <laughs> <laughs> And so it was, you know, it was very, very exciting. And it was what I found exceptionally satisfying about being a costume designer and having the opportunity to do Bridgerton was that I was able to create a world and creating a world. And that is how the world looked, how it spoke, how it felt, how you would feel watch, has the, how the audience would hopefully feel watching um, the movement of this world carry on and tell the story. It was very, very satisfying. I was the first one hired. So that's why it was so satisfying because we took that little handbook and gave it to every department that was hired. And the actors in particular loved it because it was an entirely British cast, entirely mm -hmm. British cast. And most of the actors, um, the British actors were used to doing um, Jane Austen or things of that nature. And here they were invited to participate in the Shondaland adventure. And they came in, we went through the book and they were like flabbergasted. They went, what? And it just, it was totally fresh and new and, and freeing for them. So just that in itself, the book in itself, our little handbook that we did in the beginning to say, this is what you, is this the Bridgeton world you're hoping for? Um, was very, very, very useful to every single person that you know came through the door because it did the actors were free they were not they were not um they were not glued to rules that they thought they knew you know mm -hmm. just by color and shape and form and fabrication it allowed their imaginations to really just blossom and be able to be free to create the characters so it was it was quite quite a quite a helpful tool and a way in which we actually approach this but but your show Denise Daisy is I mean I I ran through that like I held it off to like finish it in three days but I think it was three days I was trying to get it to five but I couldn't I just wouldn't do it I just wouldn't I loved it so much. It's the first piece that I've seen, uh, particularly of that time and place, that feels like I could live in it and feels um, so much of the essence of the time and not precious and just explosive with enthusiasm and youth. And Riley is remarkable, I think, mm -hmm. just remarkable and clearly sets the tone. But I just love your what you've done with the show, what the characters are, and and everything that you were able to make that piece become. It was just I, I did the fabulous. same thing you did. I read the book and then I did an entire visual representation of the book. And that's what I went in with. And when I I'd never worked with Hello Sunshine or Amazon, and I I presented this book, which was different in what you were doing because mine was all documentary footage of actual real people because I wanted it to look real and not look like a costume party you know, like a right. 70s polyester you know bad right. looking stereotype um and then I had all of the images blown up and put in the fitting room so when the actors came in they I mean it was fresh for them because none of them had dressed in 70s clothes so it was a whole new world for them entirely it but. was sensational it was sensational but you know the thing about doing a period piece is that we could be very precious. We could be very precious. You, me, any costume designer can be very precious about the period that you're working with. When I say precious, I mean so precise yeah. that it is, it takes something away 
from the freedom and spontaneity that the character has to. It's uh, too restricting. Yeah, too restricted. Very well put. And so what Denise has done, which is so fresh and inviting, and you want to hear and learn more about those people and about the period of time. And the period of time as an audience member, now I was around in that period of time, but <laughs> that, that being said, it's, I felt like I want more. I want more. It was a fresh window that I could like explore because there were things I didn't know. And I, I love the mix and I loved how you took whatever risk you were gonna take was not held back by any precious notion of what was real, what wasn't real, what it just felt the embodiment of those characters telling those stories where it was just a new window into that period of time that just felt alive. Well, I, I think to your point earlier is that I, I just wanted to look at the whole painting. I didn't want to look at the brush strokes exactly. and realize exactly. if a pair of shoes were a period accurate or if a top was period. I wanted to look at the entire painting and not focus on the little things that I could get. Hum a lot of designers get hung up in there. Like, it has to be period, has to be authentic. I did not care as long as the painting looked authentic. And I worked really closely with our DPs and our production designer was amazing. And we were all on the same page, our location manager. I, like you, gave the book to everyone. Everyone, I had an open office. Everyone could come in, see what I was doing. All of my fitting photos went to every department head. They knew what I was doing. They knew what they could work against. I would I would work with the set decorator, making sure that all of the colors looked, you know, that it just looked authentic. And that and that doesn't happen all the time, by the way. Sometimes I've done movies where it really looks like every department head is doing their own thing and there's no conversation and either people aren't willing to work together or it just you don't have the time or the money. And it's just, it's such a pleasure when that happens, when everybody's on the same page. It just, like Bridgerton, it just looks like this world, you're creating a world as opposed to just creating your thing. Exactly. It's And that's the most important part. I think that you've been given a gift and I was given a gift. And, exactly. and it really is, um, guys, a gift when it's not always like this. Uh, that's the reality, unfortunately, but it isn't where well, you can try to insist upon it and, and you kind of judge where you can and can't do it. But we were both given gifts and we were both able to create worlds that the audiences have not, they ha have never been part of. They have never seen. They're not, they're fresh and they're new and they get, um, the audience gets seduced by things uh, of that nature, especially when the world feels whole and they don't know anything about it. And maybe they have a preconceived notion about a little bit going in, but then they're surprised. And that element of surprise, it's what's going to get you every time. And, and totally two about. different worlds, by the way, we've created two different worlds. <laughs> two different <laughs> time. And, and it's interesting how we're having the similar experiences, even yeah. though they're absolutely you know, polar opposites, but it's all about creating a world. And I don't think either of us take that, that opportunity for granted that it turned out the way it did. I think no, we're not at all. Grateful. But I do have to say, you know, it's so interesting because I hadn't done television since Melrose Place in 1994. <laughs> so, and I had kind of sworn off it because what I didn't like about television at the time was the fact that there wasn't room to grow, that the characters were the same. And every week I was dressing the same characters and it just felt like it was like Groundhog Day for me. And I really couldn't stand it. And I swore off television. I did, hadn't done it in years. And um, doing this, it's like doing a 10 hour movie. Like yes. you, I was still able to create television is completely different now. And it was like a 10 hour movie and there was an arc and there was a beginning, a middle and an end. And it was so gratifying, except it was really hard. Like we were doing, <laughs> you know, doing these block shooting, cross boarding five episodes at the same time, you know, like one senior in the 1960s, the other senior in 1978, like it was so confusing for me. I had a board with little paper dolls and trying to put everybody together to see what they look like to Together. It was it was extremely um, it was different, and uh, I think 
after doing this, I think I can do anything, but it was, it was not easy. It was a beast of a show. But when you conquer those beasts, I think it becomes like, all right, give me the next. I could conquer exactly. it all. I could conquer it all. And sometimes we're lucky and sometimes we're not as lucky to get that same type of experience. But the one thing I would say about costume design is that we are fortunate in that we get to experience many different kinds of, mm-hmm. of stories and, and, and kinds of projects, whether they're streaming eight episodes, 10 episodes, or whether it's a movie for now three hours or what have you, or two and a half hours. Movies seem to get longer and longer as the streaming gets to be bigger and bigger. But um, it's it's a new world and it's a new adventure each time you go out. So that's, I think, is the, one of the most uh, satisfying aspects. Yeah. And I think the researching, I mean, part of why I do this, I, and it's interesting because I've done a lot of contemporary movies. I have absolutely no interest in contemporary fashion. I don't follow designers. I don't know any, I mean, I like telling stories. I like, I like to know why a character would wear something, where they get their clothes. Why I like, I like the psychology of costumes and telling a story. Um, So it's interesting. And I like the research of, 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 figuring out a character and and doing the research on that person and where they came from and creating backstory. So that's what's exciting for me. And every single movie is different. Um, so every that's why that story's it's different. different. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just great. And I love the research. Um, I specifically, uh, I hadn't been given a lot of opportunities to do period films, just I think based on my resume, um, but after doing this, I, di- I just enjoyed it so much. I just really enjoyed taking a deep dive into a different uh, a different era. So I'm. Have you started the next season? I, I don't know if there's going to be a next season. I've heard. Uh, I don't see how there can be, <laughs> but I'm sure that I'm sure Amazon. If there's a will, there's a way. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> but there's you know what? I loved everybody. If if there was another season, um, I you know I loved these actors so much. I loved the producers were such supporters and partners and cheerleaders and and they supported me so much. And the actors were so wonderful and we worked so well together right. that I would go back. I mean, I would do anything for any of these people. I loved it. I loved every single except for breaking my ankle in Greece and having to finish the show in a wheelchair. Other than that, it was, <laughs> it was an amazing that was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> Again, if I could do this, I could do anything. I finished it off yeah. in a wheelchair. Excellent. And you're here to tell the story with a smile. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Wow, I guess moved. you guys covered so much of what I was going to ask, which is amazing. Um, one thing maybe I'd like to ask is, I know both Daisy Jones and Bridgerton were um, period pieces, so you had that historical reference, but they're also based on books. So I wanted to know, did you use the novels at all as a source of your inspiration in creating those worlds, like you said? No. No. <laughs> well, I do. Well, it, it's no. interesting because I think that that Daisy Jones had such a huge fan base from the book. I mm-hmm. knew that there were certain things in the book, and I love Taylor Jenkins Reid. She, she wrote a really beautiful book. So there were certain things that she described in the book that I felt that the fans would be expecting. And I feel like if I didn't put them in there, I would be disappointing the fans, which is what I did not want to do. I didn't want to be that person being like, why isn't she wearing a man's dress shirt into the recording studio? Like, so I just, there were certain things I put in and then I took liberties um, mm-hmm. as well. So I think you well, have to- Take your own spell. I think that you have to t- you have to t- tell the story. I mean, actually, I shouldn't have said no like that as quickly because I mean, frankly, I was not aware of the books. The books were very, very popular in South America. Oh. Very, they were around for about twenty years before um, Shonda Shonda Rhimes bought them, purchased them to mm-hmm. make into a show, or hopefully make into a show at that time. And there was a very, very large South American fan base, Brazil, Argentina, like huge. I later found out. Now, in in the books, there were um, there were particularly descriptions of the Featheringtons versus um, the Bridgertons, and so on, and and Penelope wearing yellow, like acidic colors, and so on. So that was a key. That was the one of the only, as I learned 
Okay, I didn't like start with reading the books. I just read the pilot. I didn't really want to read the books because I knew that what was it going to be incorporated was going to be where they wanted, mm-hmm. where Shonda, Shondaland wanted to be in terms of telling the story without hurting anybody and so on. Because in the Bridgerton books, they're all of those kids, how those books come to unfold Each book is another marriage, another kid, another Bridgerton, another Featherington, another. And they didn't know if they were going to follow that path or they didn't want to be hemmed in to follow the path of the books. So that wasn't necessarily an important element. What was important was was more of the adaptation of the books and then putting our um, our our idea on top of that to actually bring it to life. Yeah, I'm sure Shonda yeah. bought those books to make, not to recreate those books, yeah. but to make her own. Yeah, she just make bought her own property. world. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. that was something very different than um, a, a specific book because that this was the beginning. It was the beginning of the series. It was the beginning of introducing the Bridgertons and then the Featheringtons and so on and how the stories unfold and how the families mix. Some of it becomes her own, her own world telling as well. Julia Quinn, who is the author of the books and a wonderful woman, um, has worked hand, worked along with the company, didn't, was not the creator, was not the person who wrote the material for um, for television, but she was very, very much a part of the process and very thrilled to see it all come to life after all of the, these years that um, she had written originally written the books. That's interesting. That's a great answer and totally makes sense with sort of creating your own world based off of already the adapted script. Um, and so I guess I'll move into my next question, um, which you talked about this, you talked about this earlier with Bridgerton, Ellen, um, about how so much of the specific vision you were looking for, the clothes that you would need were like already in existence. So a lot of it had to be made. Um, but I love to know from Denise, sort of with Daisy Jones, where were you like sourcing the clothing? Um, how did you get all of the pieces? I know that um, like I was reading an article with you and it was talking about how there was like over a thousand costume changes across the series. Oh, at least. I mean, there were, I mean, not even count. I mean, I'm, there was 1500 just for the principal. So I don't even know how much of the extras, but I guess the better question is where wasn't I getting <laughs> finding clothes? Like, I mean, we're lucky that in Los Angeles, we have amazing costume houses. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they were amazing. And it's only when we went to go shoot in New Orleans and there was nothing, did I really, really, really appreciate what we have in Los Angeles as far as, as resources. And, and we, there are great vintage stores and every weekend, even when we were shut down for COVID every single weekend, every Saturday, every Sunday, I would go to the flea markets. Um, there are different flea markets all over every weekend. So I would just, people knew me, the vendors knew me. Um, if I found, if I saw a photo of something and I couldn't find it, I made it. If I saw something at a flea market and it wasn't period accurate, it didn't matter. I'd buy it anyway. So I had, I basically, I felt like I was curating the show and I had more time than usual. So I was able to curate it. And if, and, and I would go online every night, even if we were shooting, I'd go online. And for every hundred pieces I saw, maybe there was one piece I would, I would pick. And I was very, very specific. I knew in my head what I wanted. And I had an amazing seamstress. I had people making stuff for me all over, a lot of leather work. So it was a little bit of everything. It was just this big, and like, like you know, Ellen said, I had my own costume shop. I had my own, you know, I had a room of just furs. I had, I, you know, I had just so much stuff. And, and unfortunately, um, I did because people in the 70s were actually wearing vintage clothes. So I had a lot of stuff from the 20s and 30s which um, I had a lot of loss and damage because that stuff, especially velvet, does not hold up well. And you, I really wanted things to look like it was telling a story, that the, that the clothing had a history. You can't make a velvet bed jacket and have it look like it's from the 30s. It's just not the same fabric. But I found that stuff was just rotting and we were taping it together and trying to sew it together and things were falling apart. And it was, it was not easy. I had very, very old 1930s lace kimonos and it was just... It was hard keeping everything 
intact, but I felt like it looked, it, you could feel the history of it. It felt Without very- a question. Um, it, yeah. was, it was absolutely beautiful. And you just, you, I think that that is part of, of the allure of your show is so much, but it's not a flat painting by any stretch of the imagination. It is 100% breathable, um, tactile, and absolutely of the time and place. It, I can't express, maybe I'm not like thinking of the right word to express it, but I think that your show, Denise, is of, it is so like perfect, but absolutely perfect. Maybe by being imperfect, the perfection of it is so um, breathable and tactile and you want to, you feel those people through every pore, through every stitch of, of fabric, through every morsel of everything. I think, oh, thank that, you. Thank I you. really that think so that that's the, a very, very, very big difference in Denise's work on this show that A, did have to, she wanted very, very much to document a particular period of time and a particular, tell the story of particular people in that period of time. I think that the way it is that she chose to express it is unlike any show that takes place in that period of time, because you can feel it, you could taste it, you could breathe it, you could, you you just feel everything about what those characters, who those characters are, and what that life is about in that time through every choice that she's made. And it, it comes together as a perfect quilt without a question of a doubt. And you want to just wrap yourself up in it, I think. Thank you. I did a lot. I watched a lot of contemporary movies that take place in the 70s. And it's interesting because it felt like there were a lot of, uh, you know, oddly bright colors and bright. And I, and, and I, I really fought against that. And really, and then I watched movies, a lot of movies from the 70s and went, tried to find that. But I uh, think that that's what you, I think that there was an S, a cinematic essence to it. Maybe that's the best way to express it. There's a cinematic essence to it to the whole entire piece, the whole entire piece from beginning to end that feels very different. It, the, the reason why I'm like stumbling on words is because I, I know that your show feels very different than any show that I've seen that takes place at that period of time, okay? And I think probably part of it is because of a cinematic element or a cinematic tone over the entire Thing. You know, there's the reason why we love cinema as much as we do is it's all illusionistic. It's all mm -hmm. illusionistic. It's a film that goes over everything and it is, it creates an illusion. And I think that what you've done in the way you've done it is that you've created the perfect illusion of that time. I have to say, since you're using the word cinematic, so I mean, I think if it wasn't for our cinematographer, Checo Varez, who won an Emmy last year for Dope Sick, he, I don't know what, the, the man is a magician, first of all. He's the best cinematographer I've ever worked with in my life because I would watch the dailies. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's the footage from the from the stuff that you shot the previous day. It was, it was like magic. It was literally like he had put a film over everything. And and everything looks so much better. Like, I just like, I mean, I would see it in real life, but the way he shot it, the way he lit it, whatever camera he was using, whatever, however he colorized it, it was just, he was a genius. So I think he, he made me a better designer because he would also, he would call me over and he would say, look at look. that you should do. And he would show me things looking through the lens that I did not, I, I, I either didn't notice or couldn't see from what he was seeing. He was a master and I learned so much from him. And he, he, he I, I believe he created a world that just made everything look better, you know, so. I think that, but that's a very, very important, important um, note is that, you know, with no one person is their own island exactly. at all. And, and the work that you guys have seen that we've done um, over the course of so much of our, our lives and, things that you like, 
from other designers and other people and so on. It's 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 not a little person standing on an island going, this is how it has to be. And this is what I'm, it must be. No, it doesn't really work like that. But when we are invited to the table with so many wonderfully talented collaborators who want you to see what want you to be the best that you could be who want you to see what they see and what and and experience something that maybe you haven't seen in this in the same way before it's with very, very I also think it's it, it's an important lesson that you should try and and collaborate with every department head and if yes. you if the, if you if they become your allies and your partners and everybody is invested in 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 creating the same thing um it's not always easy there's different personalities but um I, I mean every single department head we would just have meetings and 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 it was just such a joyous collaboration but it's I mean honestly the first people I become friends with are the Teamsters. They can they can like make or break you. They can park your trailer like two miles away if they don't like you. You have to become friends with everyone and everybody. It, it is it is a team. Filmmaking is a team sport. Team sport. It is not a solo sport. So it, any aspiring not. filmmakers, that that's what you should do. Make sure your team is is all, uh, you know, all in, on. all in, all all the time, all in. And exactly, it, there's. No one is above anybody else. Everybody is on equal ground, equal has equal um, ability to make or break what you're about to participate in. Yes. All righty. I think we're going to do one more question before we do the little audience Q&A. So just a reminder for anyone watching live, if you want to send in a question, feel free. Um, but for now, um, I'd love to know, you were mentioning that you had these like vintage pieces on Daisy Jones, Denise, that were not always in the best condition. Um, has there ever been a time when maybe you had to like pivot a planned costume, like maybe day of a shoe or just, um, something that you were planning that maybe didn't go to plan and had to make a creative fix? Well, I think on Daisy Jones, there was one, um, there was one outfit that I painstakingly um, designed and built. I didn't like the first one we built. We built another one. I had, I mean, it was so, it was like a month long process, this beautiful chiffon gown that I had seen a picture of Stevie Nicks wearing something similar. So I went through all of these incarnations of it until it was perfect. And then it was for the, for the cover shoot of the Aurora album they were doing in the desert. And we get there and there was snow on the ground. I mean, it was freezing. It was like a freezing windstorm and I had to put a fur coat over it I like I mean that was it that was the one scene it was the one outfit it had been on my wall I had been working I mean literally two months of trial and error to make it perfect and that was it I had to put a coat on it and it was just like it just it was so heartbreaking it's one of those kill your darlings moments and you know so it happens you know or you build something and it never makes it to screen there were a lot of costumes or amazing costumes that just got cut out completely which was again heartbreaking. I'm sure. How about Alan? you, Alan? Any <laughs> fun memories? Yeah. Um, no, I actually don't really, I don't really have that much to contribute to that. Only in the respect that I never get married to anything. So, <laughs> never, never. I, I actually. The, my process is very similar to making a painting and 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 painting and so if everything is in the right flow i'm happy but if it has to be something else other than what was originally planned i never really get too upset about it because there's always some other there's something else um and i there are things that yes have been my favorites or things of that nature and but I'm sorry, but I just don't get married to anything. I just be, and one of the reasons is because I really like the spontaneity of mm -hmm. thinking, working and making decisions on my feet. So I encourage that if it is, when it goes as planned, I don't shake up the apple cart, but I don't get upset if it gets, um, if something happens and I don't like the way it looks or it's, I plan something and I don't like the way it's going to look. And I think that there's a better choice to be made, but that's the reason for that is 
I pay very, very, very close attention to how the story is being told and how it's unfolding. And so things that I might have planned in the beginning, mm, I think that there's a better way to express it and, and might make the substitutions along the way. And I think that, again, one of our other hats that we wear is being um, an on your feet problem solvers and being prepared to pivot. And like Ellen said, you don't upset the op apple cart. You say, okay, how do I solve this problem as calmly and quickly as possible? And, and I also plan for the worst and always hope for the best. I looked at the weather. I'm like, it's going to be cold. Let me bring a couple coats. I'm going to have exactly. them standing by. So when she was like, I can't do this. It's too cold. I'm like, great. I have a coat as, as hard as was that for me to not see the dress. It was, I was prepared. So you always have to look I look at every situation. I mean, I, I do that anyway. I go into a restaurant, I look at the exits. You know, I, you plan for every scenario and um, it's helpful. And and like Ellen said, I, you cannot get upset. Nobody wants somebody that's hysterical on set. Like you you have to just be calm and just say, okay. And, you know, I'm, and then sometimes I get asked for things at the last minute, um, which is incredibly annoying because I'll ask for something literally at, at the last minute. At the blue. Out of, out of the blue, out of the blue. And, um, and I never, ever tell a director no, ever, because my husband's a director. And that's one thing he says is when people tell him no, it just pisses him off. Like, he's just like, just don't. So what I say is, okay, let me see what I can do. I'm not going to promise you anything. Let me see what I can do. And so I think that by showing that at least you're going to make an effort, even though it seems impossible. So then I can go back and say, well, I can't give you this, but I can give you this. And then at least you're not, you know, saying and sometimes just, just those things are, are a better solution unbeknownst to any of us. Some things that you never, ever, ever even thought about, but had to make that choice in the moment on the day at that, because otherwise the camera was going to be held far too long. You, it, sometimes it's just the better choice and you just don't know that that was ever gonna you didn't know that that was gonna happen when you woke up that morning yeah and there you are faced with something that had to change and the outcome is not anything that you ever expected so it's you have to be communicative mm -hmm. flexible open and and really kind of feel and see the whole world around you every possibility that could possibly exist in any scenario that you're working in and actually understand all the people that you're working with, knowing what they could possibly ask for when you least expect it. <laughs> and that is usually what breaks your back. But nonetheless, you have to, you have to do it. There isn't, you don't have you don't, you can't just walk away and say, well, I'm not prepared. You know, yeah. so you, you just can't, you, that's like, it's, it's can't. something you never like say, it. I'm not prepared. Cause no, you just can't say that. You just go, well, um, how about, I mean, I've been in a situation, not on Bridgerton, but in mm -hmm. other situations where the director for other reasons became kind of hysterical, just in a situation and something that that he had to look at was also involved. It was not, I didn't make him hysterical, but he made himself hysterical. And something that involved a costume change was involved in, and he just was like out of control. Mm -hmm. Well, now you can't really control that person. Yeah. Okay. But you could calmly approach it and say, well, okay, we could just make another choice. No, worry about it. We'll make another choice. And that in itself kind of embarrasses them and calms them down just by the, all right, fine. In a height of a childlike tantrum. Exactly. <laughs> you go, okay, well, all right. I will bring you something else that you'll really like and it'll really be fine. And so- you have to use all of those things. All of those things are part of being a costume designer or actually really working in the entertainment business. All of that, all of those little things um, in terms of communicating with people and working with people are so much part of our tool, you know, our toolkit. It's, you have to use it all the time. 
you know, it's not only, you're not only doing the costumes. Yeah. I think the, the other thing, the other thing I learned as well, it took a long time, um, was I, I worked with a director that was just, he was just screaming at people all the time. It was really difficult. He was really, it was a really upsetting experience. And what I realized is that A, I don't take anything personally anymore. If a director doesn't like a costume, I'm like, Ellen, I'm like, okay, I'm on your team. You tell me what you want. If you don't like it, that's fine. I have no I have no attachment to it. Right. And you also have to have a really thick skin because sometimes you may be yelled at and it might not have anything to do with you. It might have to be the fact that somebody's having a really bad day and you just happen to be the person in the, you know, in the, in the line of fire. Um, so, but I take nothing personally anymore. I'm, I'm, I am completely stoic with everything. I'm just like, okay, what can we do to solve the problem? We're in this together. We're in the same boat paddling in the same direction. What can we do? That's it. Exactly. But it took, took a long time to learn that actually. <laughs> But if you take all of you guys, take all of what we said and put it in a bowl and mix it up, you've gotten a really good costume class out of the <laughs> because I think you've really gotten to the truth of what it really is in terms of being a costume designer or being actually uh, the leader of a team that happens to work um, on making work telling stories. And, and creating a show and telling stories that will be entertaining to others. No, that's, it has been a great class. I feel like I've learned about all the different hats the costume designers have to wear. Um, we have one audience question that I'm going to throw out here in our remaining minutes, but Vivian wanted to know, um, what is your dream project to, to design for? Would it intersect with your personal style or do you see your style in that work? Um, so maybe do you have any like era or genre that you would love to design for in a future project? I can tell you what I don't want to do. I don't, I don't really have interest in like in, in, in science fiction or the future. I kind of prefer the past and my own personal style is just comfort, just comfortable shoes, comfortable clothes. So I don't yeah. think it has anything to do with my personal style. Um, but I, I'm really enjoying, you know, working in, in the period realm. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, I mean, there aren't a lot of period shows all, you know, they're, they're, they're hard to come by, but I, I'd like to see if I can jump back into that world. That for me is, is really, uh, it was gratifying. I think there's only one thing that I really would like, well, there's two things that I would like to do. Um, the one film that I'd like to do before I don't do this any longer is a James Bond film. Oh. Um, I have wanted to do a James Bond film since I was a little girl. So I really, I know they're gonna make another one. And I don't know that I could be the one to do it, but I really want to be the one to do it. You can do it, Ellen. You'd be great. I just want to do it. So, but usually they don't hire Americans. Well, that's, but that's okay because. Because I'm in, I'm in London. Because you're in London right now. Right now. I London. think, should we start a petition now? <laughs> yes. Yes, I wish you would. I wish you would. This is the one film on that I would be so, I and. Believe me, those James Bond films are very, very, they aren't what they what they appear to be. Mm -hmm. They are, what you see is not, I think that would be maybe an interesting story. I think you'd say to me, so how is it, how, if I was lucky enough to get a James Bond film, you'd say to me afterwards, well, Ellen, how was it making a James Bond film? And I would say, nothing like I ever thought it was. But nonetheless, I still would like to do, and and it just is the epitome of just what I love about cinema. That's great locations, great locations. Wow. I mean great locations <laughs> and great looking guys and great looking girls. I, I just love all of that vibe. You'd be great. Uh, You're perfect for thank that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then of course, I just am totally in love with the musical genre. I love music and film so very, very much. But my biggest wish is two, as I said, one was James Bond and the other is a musical on Broadway. That's it. That's what I want to do. No, those are within your grasp. That's, those I, are realistic I'm goals. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping that Putting those are the things. universe. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, without a question. It's now in the Brown University universe. That's good. Now we're, we're everyone's visual as a visual doing visualization for you right now, Helen. Oh, you know what you'll be doing on, next year. I'll be right I, I'll, next year at this time. I will tell you the, the part of the result, I hope. Yeah, you got to have part two, Lulu. You got to do yes, like a we'll uh, second round. Yeah, exactly. Updates. Updates. Yes. <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna do my last question, which is a very fun one. But if you got to steal the wardrobe of any character you designed for, whose wardrobe would you take? Well, would I think I, I, I would just do, just because I just worked with her, um, uh, Camilla, um, who oh, played yeah. Camilla. <laughs> Camilla playing Camilla, except I wouldn't be able to fit into it, but it would be nice to have. If it fit me, that would be the wardrobe <laughs> I'd like to have because she had she had amazing pieces and had I loved her. It was glorious. Ellen, any favorite? Uh, well, you know, I don't know. I I just am such a drag here, but I don't know what would be my that's also totally I don't, I don't I don't really, really know. I think I like to look at it more than I like mm -hmm. to be it. You know, I, I think I wear black all the time, head to toe. So it's really difficult for me to say, well, I think Mrs. Featherington would be perfect for <laughs> me, but I love it all. I, I love it all, but I, and, and I love glitz and I love all of that stuff. And then I love severe design, but I wear black all the time. So I just like to watch. I think you'll find that most designers, because we do this every day, we don't want to have to think about dressing ourselves. And literally my entire closet is black. I have one black and white piece I put on just so I wouldn't look like Ellen because I know Ellen wears black. <laughs> No, but That's it's it, it is literally a uniform. Like I have a uniform I, I you know, I wear every day. I don't want to think that's I have I make too many decisions in a day. I don't want to have to think that's the last thing I want to think about. I want to think about dressing other people, not myself. And I sense. don't want somebody to say to me, oh, that's really cute. Where can I get that? <laughs> <laughs> so a black turtleneck, black, black bottoms, black shoes. What else can I tell yeah. you? I literally, if I, I saw Rick Owens' closet. He's got three black t-shirts, two pairs of black shorts, two black pants, and a black jacket. That's what the guy wears every Perfect. single day. Yeah. Perfect. Um, we've learned the costume designer's uniform. So there's another tip for all of our students out there. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up. But thank you so much, Ellen and Denise, for being here today. It was such an honor to welcome you virtually to Ivy Film Festival. And this was such a delightful conversation. Um, for those of you tuning in live to this convo, be sure to um, go to our official selection tonight at, here at Brown in the Granoff um, Center for the uh, Creative Arts. And for everyone else, we'll have other virtual and in-person events um, across the rest of the week. So you can find that on Ivy Film Festival's Instagram and other social media. Um, but thank you for tuning in. And thank you again, Denise and Ellen, and for being here. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank you so Thank much, you Lou. So Thank much. you for having us. It's so nice chatting with you, Ellen. Oh, it's always a pleasure to talk, <laughs> chat with you, Denise. It was, this was I'll great. I'll see you when we're both in the same town. But we always have Zoom and we always have Lulu. So always. That's always. Very cool. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye, guys. See you later. Bye.